Hello, hello. Today is Australia Day. So happy Australia Day to everyone outside of Australia who didn't know this holiday existed until now. And happy Australia Day to every Australian watching. Originally I was going to do a video on the emu for Australia Day, since it's on the Australian coat of arms. But I thought that if I'm going to cover some famous Australian animal, might as well go with something that's also a bit of a cryptid currently. There's numerous species of this animal, known if I remember correctly. However, the one I'll be focusing on is the last one to die off, and the one we're most familiar with. Phylocinus cynocephalus, which is commonly known as the Phylocene, Tasmanian Tiger, or sometimes the Tasmanian Wolf. This particular species came around roughly 4 million years ago, and only died off recently in Earth's history, with the last captive specimen dying in 1936 at the Hobart Zoo. However, some people do believe that the animal still lives on today, which I'll talk about later on in the video. The Phylocene lived across the Great Southern Land, and if they were alive today, they'd be one of the largest terrestrial carnivores native to Australia. Males were larger than females, and it's believed Phylocenes could weigh from as little as 15 to as much as double that at 30 kilograms, with some other sources I came across stating larger than 40 kilograms. However, according to an article from the website theconversation.com, a 2020 study which analysed 100 skeletons, taxidermies, and a full body ethanol preserved specimen in Sweden found the actual average was only 16.7 kilograms and that ones saying upwards of 29.5 kilograms are newspaper articles which can't be trusted. In terms of length they were on average somewhere between 90 centimeters and 1.2 meters long when not including the tail but when accounted for, they could be anywhere between 1.2 and 2 meters long, and they stood somewhere between 35 and 60 centimeters tall at the shoulders, according to animaldiversity.org. As a comparison, Australia's current largest terrestrial predator and apex predator, the dingo, weighs anywhere between 9.6 and 19.4 kilograms. However, according to the Australian Museum's website, dingoes can get larger at about 12 to 24 kilograms, and are 88 to 92 centimeters long and stand between 47 and 67 centimeters tall at the shoulder according to animaldiversity.org. So dingoes and phylocenes are more comparable in size than most people think they are. Also, male phylocenes had a partial pouch which was used apparently as a covering for their genitals, making phylocenes one of the only marsupials that have pouches on both sexes. Alongside that, phylocenes were recorded hopping on their back legs in short distances like kangaroos, though this wasn't very common. Phylocenes are believed to have preyed upon kangaroos and other animals on mainland Australia, and wallabies, rat kangaroos, and potteroos during their final years on Tasmania. There's also been bones of echidnas found in phylocene dens, alongside bones of small calves and sheep. However, there might be reasons to be sceptical about this, since according to that conversation.com article I referenced earlier, it seems like the skull was built more so for catching smaller prey than wallabies. It's believed that with the exception of bones found in their dens, most livestock killings attributed to phylocenes were actually done by dogs. However, when phylocenes did kill farmers' livestock, they reportedly only ate specific parts of the body, which started up a myth that they drank blood like some sort of marsupial vampire, which I guess fits in with that mostly nocturnal, semi-nocturnal lifestyle, though some captive specimens were also known to be active during the day and bask in the sun. It's like you idiots don't want to listen. I am a vampire! These animals are believed to have been mostly solitary, only coming together to mate, though some scientists of the time note they might have been monogamous, meaning they lived together and mated for life. Phylocenes weren't all that well studied, and now that they're extinct, it's a little hard to get an idea of their behaviours. Anyway, phylocenes are believed to have had two to four children at a time, with the average being about three, which would feed on their mother's milk whilst in her rear opening pouch for about three months, and would stay with her in her den for another three months after leaving the pouch. It's unclear what their lifespan was, though it's believed to have been on average about five to ten years depending on what you read, with environment.gov.au claiming it could have been 12 to 14 years since a close relative, the Tasmanian Devil, 
lives longer in the wild than in captivity. The oldest known thylacine in captivity, which is often referred to as Benjamin, despite being a female Tasmanian tiger, lived for 12 years and 7 months in captivity, with the cause of her death being believed to be negligent zookeepers. Editing me here, it turns out the thylacine was not actually called Benjamin in real life, and that was actually made up by a bullshit artist. So uh, yeah, I apologise for the mistake, and throughout the rest of this video I'll accidentally end up calling the thylacine Benjamin, because I was not aware of this at the time of writing the script, and I only came across this whilst editing the video, so I apologise making her not only the oldest known individual, but also the last. Speaking of which, now that I've given a decent overview of this animal, I think I should talk about its extinction. It's not currently understood why it went extinct on mainland Australia, but one of the main theories tossed around is due to steep competition. Roughly 40 to 60,000 years ago, ancestors of modern day aboriginals arrived in Australia, and it's believed the aboriginals in Tasmania might have seen thylacines as a food source, so this most likely applies to mainland aboriginals as well. Humans are much larger than thylacines, live in social groups, and know how to make and use tools. Alongside that, when going off of one source I read, dingoes entered the ecological battlefield roughly four or five thousand years ago, with another thing I came across saying eight to ten thousand. Either way, it became a hard competitor for the thylacine to deal with. Kinda reminds me of that one clip from Transformers Prime I used for my King Brown video, if I'm gonna be honest. One shall stand. One shall fall. Dingoes had two main things going for them when it comes to outcompeting the thylacine, those being size and numbers. Dingoes are known to hunt in packs, whilst thylacines are believed to have been solitary animals, at most maybe hunting in pairs, but that wouldn't have been enough. Dingoes, as mentioned earlier, weigh somewhere between 12 and 24 kilograms according to the Australian Museum. According to AnimalDiversity.org, male dingoes weigh between 11.8 and 19.6 kilograms, and females are 9.6 to 16 kilograms. Meanwhile, the average size for thylacines was 16.7 kilograms. However, Fossils of mainland thylacines were actually smaller than the Tasmanian ones. And since larger predators are known to prey on smaller ones from time to time, this meant that the mainland thylacine was no match for the larger size and numerical superiority dingoes had. Hello, hello. Yes, it's me, editing me again. Uh, I just wanted to note that one thing someone in the comments might end up bringing up is the fact that, if I'm correctly, one study found the dingo had a weaker bite force proportionally in comparison to that of the thylacine. Uh, I think it had a, I think the dingo had a BFQ of 108, whilst the thylacine was 166. Uh, that's in newtons, by the way. However, as I just stated, thylacines on mainland Australia were smaller. Uh, than the Tasmanian ones, so you'd probably find that the bite force for both dingoes and mainland thylacines would have been about equal. Just want to clarify that. Via competition with dingoes and humans, with humans being believed to have had a larger impact, the thylacine slowly disappeared from the Australian mainland roughly 4,000 years ago. On Tasmania, they gained some relative safety, with there being an estimated 5,000 still alive, so they weren't doing too bad. Or at least until the British showed up and were like, this is mine now, and set up colonies on Tasmania. It didn't take long for thylacines to be labelled as pests, and there later came bounties from the government and companies up until 1909, with about 2,160 to 2,180 being collected between 1830 and 1909. This isn't accounting for ones collected from private landowners, by the way. In 1930, experts started to realise that Tasmanian tiger sightings were quickly diminishing and a movement began for the conservation of the thylacine, though it was all in vain. The last one reported to have been shot in the wild occurred in 1930, and the last in captivity, Benjamin, died on either September 6th or September 7th of 1936, two months after the thylacine was given protected status. In 1986, despite some eyewitness claims of thylacine encounters and numerous searches for it, 
the Tasmanian tiger was declared extinct due to there having been not a confirmed sighting in more than 50 years, driven to extinction from diseases such as mange being introduced and human hunting. It's very sad that one of the greatest predators of Australia's modern history went extinct, and by the looks of it, despite persecution against thylacines at the time, people still hope it exists. Probably because it would give Tasmanians a bad look if it is extinct, since that mean they killed the animal in their coat of arms. There's been numerous people throughout history, whether they're random tourists, game hunters, or local Tasmanians claiming to have seen it. According to Cryptid Wiki and environment.gov.au, there's been numerous searches for thylacines, including one that lasted a year round in 1985. However, when the researchers never found anything, the next year it was officially listed as an extinct species. There's also been people reportedly taking photos or witnessing thylacines in places such as Western Australia and South Australia, however they haven't been confirmed. Most evidence for thylacines still being alive pretty much is either low quality shaky footage or photographs, which is honestly just a joke at this point, and eyewitness claims as mentioned earlier. The problem with this is that, with the footage and photos, we live in an age where stuff like Photoshop is easily available and free to use, and in the older times before Photoshop, you can always play little camera tricks to make stuff seem different or use a taxidermy specimen if possible. As an example of what you could use for trick photography, check out this animal I found. This is a numbat. Because of the similar, though thicker stripes of a thylacine, you could easily just do some trick photography, distort the image a little, and only photograph the rear, and you might be able to pass it off as a thylacine. Or how about some dog breeds out there? Heck, I remember even seeing a video of what they claimed to be a thylacine, that honestly looked like they just painted stripes on their dog's back. Due to anatomical similarities between dogs and thylacines, thanks to a little thing known as convergent evolution, you'll probably find that a lot of videos of supposed thylacine sightings are just dogs. The main differences between thylacines and dogs is the tail and back legs. This joint on the legs of dogs is placed lower on thylacines, and the tail of thylacines is more rat-like and skinny. So if you're ever shown footage of a supposed thylacine, I highly recommend looking at the back legs and tail. And the problem with eyewitness claims is that no matter whatever or however many credentials they might have, or how trustworthy they are or appear to be, they could still either be lying or have mistaken something else for a file scene, such as dogs or foxes with mange. For this video, I've been reading through quite a few articles from the website theconversation.com, and I came across one about a study that found thylacines might have already started to head down the road to extinction before humans even encountered them in Tasmania. The study analysed the genome of a preserved specimen and found that thylacines had a low genetic diversity, meaning that they weren't in the best shape genetically. This means they would have been more vulnerable to stuff like disease. To me at least, this does to a certain extent disprove the idea of it still living in the wilds of Tasmania, and that if they are still alive in Tasmania, they'd be extremely inbred. And if you google side effects of inbreeding, you can see that inbreeding isn't a good thing to do, since it leads to infertility and higher child mortality rates. But at the same time, being aware of one stereotype about Tasmania, it'd be fitting for the animal on their coat of arms to do it, I guess. One second of this bloke and I hate him more than anyone that I've ever met. Jokes aside and moving away from cryptozoology, I want to talk about the announcement last year of Texas-based genetic engineering company Colossal partnering with TIGRR Labs at the University of Melbourne to try and de-extinct the thylacine. Colossal is also the same company trying to bring back the woolly mammoth in case they sound familiar to you. To my knowledge, it's been attempted a few times before to de-extinct the thylacine, such as with the University of Sydney in 1999, which was later cancelled in 2005 or 2007 when it turned out the DNA of museum specimens wasn't in good condition for such a project. Now as if I haven't mentioned this website before in this video, I came across another article from The Conversation where they asked five experts about de-extincting it, and I also read through a couple other articles they have on the subject. The basic argument to bring it back is because it can help heal the con- The basic argument is to bring it back because it can help conservation and help heal the ecosystem and stuff like that. 
in the article I read through, one of the experts, who works at TIGRR Labs, made the claim the process used to de-extinct it could help us with treating cancer if successful. To be honest, I feel like that's kind of starting to get desperate for a reason to de-extinct the file scene, due to how many times there's been people claiming that this or that could or can cure cancer, but I'm not a geneticist, so I have no clue what I'm talking about, and I'm gonna shut up before I say something stupid. Personally, I'm also agree with the idea of not bringing back the file scene. The file scene, in my opinion, should be seen as a cautionary tale of why we must be careful of the effect we have on nature. There's numerous animals on Earth that need our help right now. Breeding programs and buying land to declare as natural reserves is what we should be doing right now. How long do you reckon it will take for us to make a final scene? And not just that, but as pointed out in another conversation arc or I read through, we need more than one. We need hundreds. How long will that take? If we're facing such a massive extinction that's happening so rapidly we must do something now or else half of all non-human life will be extinct by 2050 or whatever they're claiming now, then why are we spending money on the longest and most costly option of them all, which could take decades and might not even succeed? And then that brings up other questions, such as genetic diversity in said population. Another one is farmers in Tasmania. How do you think they'll react, since they'll most likely still have the mindset of if it has teeth and goes near their sheep, they'll fill that thing up with enough bullets to the point it'll be a wonder if there's even anything left of it. Also, to me this brings up the question of when will we stop exactly? Are we going to stop at Tasmania or are we going to try introducing it to mainland Australia also? Since some people claim that the dingo isn't native to Australia, I could imagine people pushing for the complete extermination of the dingo and for the thylacine to replace it on mainland Australia as a result of this. I'll talk more about people saying the dingo isn't native to Australia more when I do a video on the dingo itself. Overall, the thylacine, like all animals both extant and extinct, is a masterpiece of evolution and is a beautiful animal. It's sad it went extinct as a result of human arrival in Australia, both by Aboriginal ancestors and European colonialists. However, as stated earlier, it should be seen as a cautionary tale of the side effects we as a species have on ecosystems, not in Australia, but worldwide. I hope everyone enjoyed this video. I wanted to do something special for Australia Day, and I was originally planning on doing either the Red Kangaroo or Emu, since they're on the Australian coat of arms. I was also thinking of doing a video on the AC Sentinel tank, which was Australia's first indigenously produced tank, and then I was also thinking of doing one on the Owen gun. Then I thought of doing a video on Australia's current tank, the M1A1 AIM Abrams. Since for Halloween, an American holiday, I covered an Australian cryptid, so I thought it would be funny to then cover something American for an Australian holiday. However, I thought the final scene would be the best pick due to it being a famous extinct animal, a candidate for de-extinction which got widespread attention a few months ago, and it also being somewhat of a cryptid itself. Hopefully you found this video educational and will like, share and subscribe as a result.